We're in our series called I Love My Church. And uh, last week we talked about I Love My Church because I'm connected to the church. Today we're going to talk about the serving aspect of the church. And there's a phrase that I want to get across right off the bat. Saved people serve people to save people. Save people serve people to save people. There's a bigger picture than just coming to church. You know, we can see what happens when a church is full of people that come to church. They sit and they enjoy the church service and they listen to the words and maybe they, they sing songs and they sing praises to God, but they have not been motivated in their heart to love God. They know all about him, but they've never been able to put the love that they have for him into actions because of him. And once we get our heart towards him, we have to know what Jesus truly did. In Mark chapter 10, verse 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to serve, to be served, but to serve and to give him his life a ransom for many. If you're serving in the church right now, we want to say thank you. Our church could not be who our church is unless it was for people like you that say, I will sacrifice and I will serve. You're not serving me. You're not serving the church. You're serving God. And when we get into perspective, whatever we do, wherever we go, the action that we perform, it is not out of a duty to the church. It's out of a loving obligation to God. Sometimes we need to have a servant heart. Sometimes we need to say, I need to serve somebody. Not that I have to, but I get to. I have to have that attitude. What would it be like when you enter into the presence of God and you can sing songs to him and praise his name, but he never knew you? Fred Ludwig put on his Facebook this week a, a video, and, and I watched that Facebook post, and I thought, that was pretty stinking good. And uh, so I asked if I could rip it off, and we're going to watch this, about a three-minute video clip of a man um, doing a drama about going to the presence of God. Let's watch this video. So for now, there's no more purpose for my lungs because I'm not breathing. If I thought that I was still alive and I think I was dreaming, I just left the earth. My soul escaped my body now. I'm dead. And I'm rising into the heavens to find lies ahead. This life is over and my time is done on earth. There's no more stressing. I'm about to meet the one that gave me all my life and blessings. Now it's time to hear his voice and it's time to feel his embrace. And it's that time to meet my God and now it's time to see his face. I'm in a gate and I don't want to wait. I want to see my Savior. I'm going to feel his presence. Have his safety and bathe in his favor. Wait. They open up the gates, and sunlight dances through the entrance. If I was alive, I'd pass out from the beauty of his presence. I can sense him all around me. I can feel him every place. He's here. I feel it, but that's not enough. I want to see his face. They close the gate as I walk in. Not any memories are useless. Any earthly love is worthless, because no other can produce this. So much color, so much life and wind and sun and love. You're my rock, my life, my ever-present help in times of trouble, and I love 
See, I believe churches are full of people that know all about Jesus. I believe the churches are full of people that hear sermons and sing songs that can tell you the actions that Jesus performed, but they do not have the relationship with Jesus in their heart. And if we do not have a passion for Jesus in our heart, the deeds that need to be done will be done by someone that has that passion. Somebody that will serve Jesus. Well, it may not be my gift. It may not be what I want to do. It may not be what I like. But the need needs to be done. I don't want to go into that nursery. I don't want to go into the children's ministry. I don't want to go to that youth camp. I don't want to go to that mission trip. I don't want to sing. I don't want to clean the parking lot. I don't want to, to shovel the snow. I don't want to clean the chairs or clean the carpets. But somebody must do it. I don't want to mow the grass. I just want to come to church. I just want to hear the songs and listen to the sermon. And when we do not have a passion for Jesus, we will satisfy ourselves by being the Sunday morning Christian and wash our hands and be nice and clean and come up from church and say, church was good today. Church isn't designed to be good. We're even serving the church for the benefit of the body or we are serving the church for our own self-interest. I like to do that. I am seen doing that. I'm applauded while I do that. I'm appreciated when I do that. But what about serving when we are not appreciated? What about serving when nobody sees us, when nobody cares Nobody's going to give you an attaboy or a pat on the back. What about serving Jesus because Jesus wants you to? What about serving the body because you love the body because we are the bride of Christ? Ultimately, I think it comes down to this. Where is our heart? And what are we doing? Because saved people serve people. And we are the body of Christ. So if we are saved, it is natural for us to serve. It is natural for us to serve to help others. But the hardest part about it is very prideful when we say, I will serve if it's convenient. I will serve if I'm good at it. No, you know what? <laughs> I think that the nursery gets the, the raw end of the deal a lot. I don't think any of us are gifted in changing diapers. Now let me go to the nursery and change diapers. But you know what? They do it every Sunday morning. And they do it every Wednesday night. Is it a gift? Probably not. Is it a talent? I bet not. It's something that needs to be done. And because somebody has a passion for God, they fulfill their need because God needs them to, re to reach people for the cause of Christ. See, save people that work in the nursery, that work in the children's ministry, that work in the youth ministry, that works on the greeter ministry, that works in security, they are serving you so somebody in here can hear the message of Jesus Christ. And because they serve, somebody may get saved. And if they did not serve, you may not get the message. 
You know, there are two times in any message where Satan shows up big time. Can I tell you when those two times are? During the offering, you hear all kinds of things happening. The sound system goes crazy. Babies start crying. Everything takes place. People walking out the doors. When it comes to the offering, Satan shows up in a gigantic way. But a bigger time than in the offering is during the invitation. When the Holy Spirit of God is prompting your soul and he's trying to convict you that you need a relationship with Christ. And all of a sudden, something takes place. You're distracted. The doors are open. Things happen. And you say, not now. Because Satan wants to distract us. And saved people need to serve. We need to love. And we need to care. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship. What's that next word? Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are created by God to fulfill good works. And this is the body of Christ. The Bible says clearly that what we are supposed to do is to love Jesus. And we are the feet and the hands and the eyes of Christ. And what we must do is we must serve. We must do. We must not just go and soak it up and learn how to sing and learn how to enjoy the sermon and think how great church is. We must get involved, not just to hear, but to do to be part of the body of Christ is not just coming to church. The church is full of people coming to church. We're not here. The institution of the church is not here to serve those that are here. The institution of the church is to serve those that are not here. And when the church gets its mindset, I am here to grow, I'm here to learn, I'm here to put feet to my thoughts and to my actions and to my love, then I can look out and say, who needs me? Who needs me? I can serve in the church and I can do great things and I can do the medial tasks. But the job of the church is to love and to serve. John chapter 13 is a pivotal time in the Bible. All the way up to John chapter 13, Jesus is talking to those that are rejecting him, that, that are mocking him, that are belittling him. But John chapter 13 comes to the point that he goes up to the upper room and he starts his discourse from John chapter 13 to John chapter 17. He's talking to his disciples. He's talking to the early church. He's talking to these, these men. And he starts talking to these guys. And he's trying to share some things that are very important to them. And the whole crux of John chapter 13, verses 1 through 17, is a point. One point. And it's about serving. Peter and James and John gets up in the upper room. And they start arguing and fighting. And they say, Jesus he likes me more than he likes you. I am going to be higher in the kingdom of God than you are. He likes me. I'm better than you. He's going to put me in a position of power. You, you're not as good as me. He doesn't like you as much. And they're in the upper room, and Jesus is about ready to be betrayed and put to death. He does something that's phenomenal. He senses in their spirit the pride and the arrogance of his early church. And he says in his heart, if the church is going to be so prideful and so arrogant that they think about where their position is and they forget what their position is, their position is they're going to heaven. But how do they get to the position? I didn't come to this earth to die for 12 men. I came to this earth to die for the world. And if all these men are thinking about is their position in heaven, they will never serve and do the right thing. So they walk into this room and they, they lounge around the table. None of them, none of these 12 men took the basin of water and washed anyone's feet. And that was the custom of the day, that the servant would wash the feet. But Jesus gets up, takes off his coat, puts on a towel, and takes the basin of water and washes feet. Starts with Peter. Peter. Peter said, hey, dude, you're not washing my feet. And Jesus said this. He said, he said, you are clean, but everyone must be washed. Your feet are dirty, which represents once we're saved, we're going to heaven, but we all need clean feet. We all need Jesus to come into our life. We all need to have our sins forgiven. 
In verse 7 it says, Jesus answered unto him, What are you doing? You do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, I do not wash you. You have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, He who is bathed need, needs only his wash his feet, but so completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. There he also said, You are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken the garment, sat down again and said to him, do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should go as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Jesus was not talking about washing feet. He was making a gigantic parallel from service. I am Jesus. I am the very son of God. Tomorrow, I'm going to be crucified for the sins of the entire world. My life for 33 years was to bring people to a saving knowledge of Christ. And you walk in here the night I am about ready to be betrayed and you talking about who's the greatest? Your arrogance and your pride? You talk about how great you are? You are nothing. I have to tell you, the greatest thing that you can do is what I have just done. Get off your pride. Humble yourself. Get on your knees and serve. Serve somebody, not because they can't do it themselves, but because you want to honor me. And when we serve because of Jesus, it makes no difference what we do. You know who we did it for. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to be served. But I believe it's very important. Those that serve should have the responsibility to serve anyone that God brings in front of their path. Early in my ministry, I, uh, I worked for a, a guy by the name of Wilbur, um, and I was the only guy on staff. And on staff, I had to, I, I was my first staff position, and, and it was me and Wilbur, and Wilbur was like 70 years old. So I had to, I had to set up the tables and the chairs, and, and I had to clean the windows, I had to vacuum everything. It was just, it was just a two-man show. And uh, uh, something happened. We had a banquet, and... Uh, I had everything set up. It was nice and clean, and everything was ready to go. And so everybody came in. We had this banquet. It was time to tear down the banquet. So I, I, in my mind, I was 23 years old at the time, and I was thinking, you know, it would be nice if I had some of these men to help me tear down the banquet, which is most people would do that. So I walked up to the most influential man in the church. thought that would be the place to start. <laughs> Clearly it wasn't. He goes, I said, I, I said hey, do uh, you think you could help me tear down these chairs so we can get out of here better? He goes, he goes, is there something wrong with your hands? I said, no, I was just trying to get some help. He goes, he goes, I pay you to pick up the chairs. I said, oh, that's how we play the game. There's a mind-boggling mindset at that point within my life that that church did not want to minister. That church wanted to be ministered to. I never asked that man. And matter of fact, to this day, it's very hard for me to ask anyone because I'm afraid that you're going to say, what's wrong with your hands? What's wrong with what you are supposed to do? I would rather do it myself than be embarrassed by asking somebody and they say no. It, 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 this has happened in this church. I'll, and none of you here, if, I, if you did it, I apologize that I'm using this illustration. But <laughs> the commode is overflowing. It was just clog it up. I was sitting on the front pew right here getting ready five minutes to preach. And a man comes up to me and says, he says, Bruce, you need to go undo the, undo the toilets overflowing. I said, dude, I'm not going to undo the toilet right now. He goes, it's going to stink in there. I said, go get the stinking plunger. It's not my job at 1030 on Sunday morning to unclog the commode. Sometimes we have to see things 
We have to be able to do things. It is not maybe your job. You may not have the title of maintenance engineer at Glenville. But if something happens on Sunday morning at 1030, pick up the stinking plunger. Somebody give me an amen. It is our church. It's our church. It's not my church. It's our church. Find the purpose. Find what needs to be done, whether it's menial or important. Nothing that you do for the cause of Christ will go unnoticed. Nothing. Whether you pick up a piece of paper or you're leading somebody to the Lord, the audience that you care about is Jesus. If you get a add a boy by me, if you get a raise up, thank you for what I've done, praise God. But you know who you're going to get an attaboy from and you're going to be blessed by? And that is God. We serve a big God. And he loves this church. And what he wants is a body of Christ that's going to love the church and serve church no matter what. Knowing there's a separation between knowing something and doing something. And I thought that was a great illustration. Knowing about God. Knowing about church. Raising his hands. Worshiping. I want to see his face. He's heard all about it. But there has to be a time that we come before Christ and bow our knee and say, I need Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I'm tired about singing about him. I'm tired about reading about him. Now I want to have something deep within my soul to serve him. Not just to know, not just to point, but to actually serve. Here's the part. Service takes humility. Service takes humility. It means I may not want to do that. I don't desire to do that. I'm not gifted in that area. I'm going to stay away from that. But when we have a passion for God and we see that the church needs something, we serve the bride. We serve the church, not because I want to. It's because Christ has asked me to. It's not normal to humble yourself. But that's exactly what Jesus did. It's very difficult sometimes to humble ourselves and not make excuses. But that's exactly what Jesus did. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't make an excuse in the upper room and said this, church, you 12 guys, you're grumbling, you're talking about who's the greatest, who's the best. You know what? I didn't do my job, so I'm going to postpone it. You guys, go do it. I'm making an excuse. I'm not going to be betrayed. I'm not going to die on the cross because the church is too arrogant, too prideful. They're thinking about themselves. They're not thinking about the world. And I believe sometimes the church is right here, right now, thinking about themselves and not thinking about Christ. Thinking about whether they like the music or they like the sermon. Whether they like the facilities or they're paying too much. What is going on? Mark chapter 10, verse 45 for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And do what? And give his life as a ransom. Jesus came with humility to give his life. And his life was everything. Jesus gave up everything to save an individual. As saved people, we should always serve people. And when we serve people, people will get saved. When people aren't being saved... When we are not sharing our life, the last week of this sermon series is, is talking about our story, talking about sharing our life. We love our church because of a shared life. When somebody's hurting, when somebody's struggling, when somebody's going through a calamity, where do we go? Can we come into the house of God? Can we come into the church? Can we minister to one another and care for one another? How is your heart for serving? Does it beat for the cause of Christ or out of obligation because nothing is getting done. See, I believe that if our heart as a church body is beating because we have a passion and a love for Christ, it will change the way everybody else sees serving. But if serving is a, a drudgery, I've got to do this or I've got to do that, then when you go to that summer camp for that week, and you go to that camp and it becomes a pain to go to that camp, guess what happens? Those kids that get saved, they're going to sense that you didn't want to be there. And they're not going to be excited. But those kids that give their life to Christ, when you have sacrificed for your time, 
and you can give them a high five and you can be the mentor that they need to be. You serve them, they get to see Christ and you get to experience that within their life. When people give their life to Christ and they get baptized, we ought to celebrate their life. We ought to honor them. We ought to serve them. We ought to take care of them because if a church does not serve we become something that Jesus does not recognize. We became an entity that does not honor Christ. But when we are a church that serves, that loves, we do what Christ did. In John chapter 13, verse 4, Jesus rose up from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. Jesus was the most important person in the room. He was not the servant he was the Lord and Master. He was the leader of the church. He got up, he took off his towel, put on the wash towel, went by every one of their feet and washed their feet. Jesus was willing to get involved in every area of life. He even washed every one of their feet. Judas was there, he washed his feet. So what are some traits that we need to have? A servant has to have a willingness to get involved. He had to have a willingness to get involved. We can't do everything for every person. But when the Holy Spirit of God communicates to you and says, I need you to do this, we have to do it. A few years ago, there was a man that passed away, a member of our church, and his wife is still a member here, and uh, passed away, and, and his wife came up to me and said, Bruce, we need, some, we need some help. We have to move his stuff from his apartment to, to the house. And uh, I'm thinking, dude, I'm 50 years old. I really don't want to be moving refrigerators and stuff, but um, I felt compelled. And I said, I will have a group of guys there Monday morning. So I called 10 guys, and not one guy said no. They got up, and we moved uh, Mr. Keir's stuff from his apartment to where it needed to go. A widow that just lost her husband needed help. It wasn't much. But we got to serve her. We got to love her. And we got to show her that the church is not there to give you a pat on the back and a slap upside the head. We're there to give you a hand and to love you when you need to be loved. Could we do that for every person that ever asked for everything within the church? I wish we could. But what we need to do is when the Holy Spirit prompts us, we give to them and we help them. Don't just show love to God with your lips. Do it with your legs. Don't just come to church and worship his name. We still sit at the table. Jesus was at the table. And sometimes we're sitting at the table and we're enjoying. And we need to sit at the table and we need to learn and we need to eat the nourishment of the word of God and we need to sing his praises and we need to do all that. We need to sit at the table and grow and learn. But yet, we can't stay at the table. Sometimes, just what Jesus did, we have to push back from the table and we have to see a need and fulfill the need. Sometimes we just need to have a willing heart. Push back from the table. Be willing to do whatever it needs to be done. Push away and see what God can do. Do something for the cause of Christ instead of critiquing the cause of Christ. Now li listen, uh, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a preference on I was at a pastor's conference for all week this week. Okay, so this guy was preaching to a bunch of pastors, okay? Um, and some of it was good, some of it was... I needed to hear, okay? I didn't like it, but I needed to hear it. There was a sermon there. He said, he said, do you know that people are leaving the church? It's not something pastors talk about. How many of you are running? Well, let me tell you how we're doing. I'll tell you all day long the positives. I'll tell you all day long how great everything is. But this sermon was not about how great it is. This sermon was open your eyes and see through their lens, not your lens. They 
Do not see the things that you see because you have the utopia glass. Everybody loves Glenville. Everybody loves what's going on. No, they don't. I don't even love everything that's going on. But you know what? I love the people that God put me in front of this church. And what we have to do is we have to quit critiquing the negative and start serving the body of Christ. And if we start serving the body of Christ, guess what they will stop doing? They'll start criti stop critiquing because they're being served. Now, serving is very important. There's two things that, that will give an indicator whether you have a passion for Christ or not. This is not church attendance, okay? Everybody thinks, well, I was at church Sunday, so I love Jesus. <laughs> no, your wife just made you come to church on Sunday morning. There's two indicators whether you have a passion and love for Jesus. First one we've already talked about. Do you serve him? Not just come to church, but do you serve him? And next week is going to be the one that you probably want to skip on. It's people that love the church, sacrifice, and give to the church. Ooh, I'll, I'll give my $10. I'll give my $5. Sacrifice, serving, giving. We need to exercise our faith. We can't get to the next step until we're at this step. We have to connect, we have to serve, we have to get involved. Now, a servant goes low to bring others up. You know, it's, it's, it's easy to hang out with people just like you. It's easy to hang out with people that you like. It's easy to go out for dinner with people that you can talk about anything you want to talk about and it's all cool. But serving somebody is noticing who needs you. And Jesus got from the table and he kneeled down and he washed their feet. Jesus was the first one to get up from the table. Jesus had the perception with his heart that it was not going right. What we must do is change what we're doing. We can't serve because we're guilty. We change and serve because we love Christ. We don't serve Glenville because Glenville needs volunteers, which we do. We serve Glenville because Jesus loves Glenville. We serve Glenville because we want to honor Christ in everything that we do. When the body of Christ has 100% of people saying, I love my church, not because of the preacher, not because of the music, it's because it is the body of Christ. What can I do to make this church better? Not what can I change? Not if you do this, I'll come back. No, it's what can we do to serve the body of Christ? We have to have a willingness to get low, to get on our knees before Christ, to change our hearts and to change our attitude and to say, Lord, I want to be humble in my service. Humbled in my service. And it may not even be what you're good at. You may be scared to death to do what God has asked you to do. You may think, is there anything else I can do? Serving is being humble. Serving is saying, what's next? Now, I do believe some people need to quit doing everything within the church. And some people start need to do something within the church and make that nice little balance. But you know what? Until that gets there, I just say thank you for all those that do everything within the body of, tri body of Christ. It takes humility to say, I'm going to do something different than what I'm comfortable with. I'm going to give it a chance. It's pride that says, no, nope, give me something else. Let me do something else. Service is not being asked to do something. Humility in service is what needs to be done. How can I help the body of Christ? What needs to be done? What needs to be done at this church this month that you could do? You know, there's going to be some activities. You know, we make a joke about this. This summer, we, the yard does need to be mowed every once in a while. And there are guys that come up and bring their mower, and they mow, and they weed eat, and they trim. Thank you. Because when it's not, it's on a Saturday night, and it looks like junk. Guess what? I'm going to be out there at 5 o'clock on a Saturday night, and I'm going to mow the yard because this is God's house. When we see something, we must do whatever it takes to get it done. A servant has a willingness to get messy to make a difference. You have to have a willingness to get messy. What's the word messy? Risk. You may get dirty. 
We don't need to have positions of authority, but we need to have a heart of service. Getting messy. There's a phrase in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 and 9. I want to read the scripture. I want to give you this phrase that I think is very important. Also, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made of himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of man, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Therefore God also had highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every other name. In verse 8, it says he humbled himself. When people are prideful, they're cocky, they're arrogant. There's a phrase that we say, he is full of himself, right? He, 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 he thinks he is it. He's full of himself. He thinks that nothing can go wrong. He thinks everybody likes him. He thinks he is it. He's, he's a cat of all cats. He thinks he can do whatever he wants to do. Here's what Jesus did. Humbled himself. What Jesus did was he emptied himself. He was the man that had the highest praise. He could do whatever he wanted. He could do whatever, whatever, however he wanted to get done. But he humbled himself. He emptied himself. The total opposite of what we do. We are puffed up. We are proud. We are full of ourselves. Jesus on purpose, emptied himself. And when we empty ourselves, what happens is God then can fill us. But if we fill ourselves with pride and arrogance of things that I want, there is no room for the blessings of God. And if there's no room for the blessings of God, we need him. When is the last time you made yourself nothing? When was the last time you made yourself available? When was the last time you thought, you know what, I can help, I can do, I can serve. I don't know if I'm good at it, but guess what? I want to help and I want to serve. God doesn't want something from you. He wants something for you. God doesn't want something from you. He wants something for you. When that first child or that youth department, that teenager or maybe it's even your child, walks up to you six o'clock at night, 11 o'clock in the morning, maybe it's after a youth camp experience or a children's church experience, and says, Kevin, I need to talk to you. The thrill, the motivation, you sacrifice, you've taken off work five days, You've used all your vacation days. Your wife is mad at you because you're not going to get the paycheck that you thought you were going to get. And you said, you know what? I am going to serve Jesus. I'm going to do this. And that little child comes up to you and says, I need to talk to you. And you get the privilege of leading that child to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. You know what you would think at that time? I don't care about the money. I get the biggest experience of my life by leading somebody to the saving knowledge of Christ and they will never forget this and I will never forget the experience that God has given to me. But it didn't start with the salvation experience. It started back here when you say, I will serve, I will do, I will sacrifice. I am going to do something greater and God is going to do something in me. I may serve, but that's not gonna change. What's gonna change is my heart God's going to change me. And guess what? Retirement, there's no age limit in Christianity. We serve until we die. You can pray. You can honor. You can love. You can serve. There's nothing that this church doesn't need more than people that just have a passion for Christ. On their knees, humbly saying, Lord, bless this church. Lord, give to us the ability and the experience that we can have to impact people's lives. There's no retirement plan. Your retirement plan is when you close your eyes, you get eternity with Jesus Christ forever. That's a better retirement plan than just saying, I'm going to rest for a while. John chapter 13, verse 17. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. The video. I went to church. I sang his name. 
I listened to the sermons. I heard all about him. Going to church doesn't do anything for us. Church is a vehicle to point people to Christ. Your name on this church roll, nothing. Your name in the Lamb's Book of Life means everything. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. What does that give you? Full of joy, peace, serving someone, and be blessed. Blessed. It simply means God's breathing his universe, his, his resources. He can give to you anything he wants when we are blessed by God. Blessed. Not just to come to church. I've seen a lot of people come to church and they're not necessarily blessed. But being blessed means if you serve, if you do, if you know what needs to be done, we humble ourselves, we get rid of our pride, and we do for the right reason. Save people, serve people, because serve people become saved people. Serve people become saved people, and you are the server. There's not a greater joy than to serve. For every action, there's a reaction. For every action, there's a reaction. Now, the Scots, their cell group, they're remodeling the bathroom. I was trying to think about this, and I don't have a, I don't have a reaction to this action. I was saying, somebody's going to get saved because you're remodeling the bathroom. Uh, somebody may be safe because you're remodeling the bathroom. But every action, because you're willing to serve, God is going to bless because of your service. Whatever you do, however you serve, whatever you do for the cause of Christ, just say, it's not about me. It's about him. And when I serve, it's not a good attaboy. It's not a thank you. And clearly don't say, what's wrong with your hands? Just say, thank you. I'll be glad to help you. Because service, you're not doing it for me. You're not doing it for the church. You're doing it for Jesus. Jesus stood up from the table. He saw that the church, that his early church was about ready to start, was full of prideful and arrogant men that thought about their position. And he said, guys, it's not about position. It's not about your pride. He said, isn't the master greater than the servant? But look at what I'm going to do. I'm going to take off my teacher role, my rabbi role, and I'm going to get down with you and I'm going to wash your feet as the lowliest servant in the room. And I'm going to teach you a lesson. Never stop serving. If you ever get to the point where you think you don't deserve it or that you're too good for it, then we are going to lose the blessing of God. You want God's hand on you? Don't just come to church. Don't just listen to the songs. Don't just learn the Bible. Do. Do. Put your feet to it. Open your eyes. See who needs you. See who is hurting. See who needs prayer. Who needs ministered to. Who needs caring. And be a friend. Be somebody that they love to be around because you serve them. And I guarantee you when we do that, God changes the perception of church. When we see Jesus face to face, he's gonna say, well done. Well done, thy good and faithful church member. I think it's well done, thy good and faithful servant. A servant is somebody that does what the teacher or the master has asked them to do. And Jesus is our rabbi. He's our teacher. And we stand before God because we know him, because we've accepted him as our Lord and Savior. And one day he's gonna stand in front of us with his arms wide open, and he'll say this, well done, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter into rest. That is our joy. That is our dream. That is what we desire. Let's start serving to get where God wants us to go. Let's bow our heads. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you, and Lord, we love our church. And Lord, we love our church because you gave it to us. And you've asked us to keep the church and you've asked us to motivate the church to serve, 
to love, to give, to be part of a bigger thing than what we could ever have to ourselves. Because this is your church, and this is why you want us to be here. So, Lord, I pray that you'll be with us today. I pray that our service will be one that we open up our eyes and we do what needs to be done. We, we look at things to, to have us, to be motivated, to get rid of our pride and to ask for our humility, to look at somebody and love them and help them, encourage them, save people, serve people, to save people. Let us be motivated to serve others so they can see Christ in us and they will follow Christ because of us. In Jesus' name we do pray, amen.